the unfair advantage. So this is this is a this is something that has many different names. On a business plan, you will see this competitive advantage, barriers to entry, unfair advantage. There are different names for it, and I kind of put this on there because I while I feel that this so while I feel that unique value proposition is the harder one to get right, this is the harder one to fill um, at this stage. It's it's one that when most startups build a product, they don't have any unfair advantages. Unfortunately, people like invent ones or use ones that aren't really, and actually, dis and actually do a disservice to them. So, if you're trying to get funding, and this is the the, the, the um, definition that I fall that I subscribe to is one that um, someone here in town, Jason Cohen, actually put out and blogged about uh, several months ago, maybe last year. I forget the time frame, but he had been through uh, a number of capital factory applications and kind of made an observation about how all these startups were putting things as unfair advantages that really weren't. So they're putting things like passion and determination and knowledge about the space as being unfair advantages, which you know can be, but they're not really like that tangible from an investment investment standpoint. Um, and then also things like you know number of features or we have got you know, more features or less features or killer features. All of those things are not really examples of unfair advantages. So the the one definition that Jason put out is the one that I like the most is something that cannot be easily copied or bought is a true unfair advantage. And I'll, I'll step and talk a little bit about some of what are some of those examples here in a second. But I like this definition because it's, it kind of goes down to the point. So if you look at features, for example, that's something that if you do have this great killer feature, well, what's stopping somebody else from just kind of blindly copying it, which happens inadvertently. Even Facebook, um, which is an example I've been using a lot for some reason today, um, has, has got so many clones of Facebook. You can actually go online and buy PHP scripts of a Facebook clone for $200, $300, because that's about how much it's worth. Because Facebook's unfair advantage is not in the features, it's not in the code anymore. It's in the network effects that they have built, which is an example of an unfair advantage that you may not have on day one, but you're able to then build up over time. So let's look at some of the examples of what real unfair advantages might look like. So the first one, and the word, so where the word unfair comes from, I know some people have, have questioned why like I, I kind of use the word unfair, like what's really unfair about them. So I'll start with one that truly is unfair, and that is the insider information advantage. So if you have been in a domain, uh, industry domain, and you have got some insider information, um, it's not fair to your competitors, but that's an advantage that you have over them, and you can build a product or build have a relationship with a customer that they don't. Um, the other example might be personal authority. So if you're considered an expert in a particular field, say you invented a very strong encryption al algorithm, RSA for example, and you build a company around it, um, that gives you a huge advantage over other people who might just want to license that encryption algorithm from you. So that's an example of how you can, you can have a, a compelling unfair advantage. Um, if you have a dream team, say you go and you recruit some of the best minds, so um, in in so some of the early um, software software circles, there were companies like Rational Rose that were built around finding what they call the four amigos, the people who were experts in their fields. They brought them together, created a company together. That was a dream team of, of thought leaders in that space. And that created an unfair advantage. The tools they were building were just by definition, whether they were actually better or not, but just by perception, going to be better because they had these great thought leaders behind those tools. So that can be an unfair advantage that you have over other people. And all of these are, are, all of these can be something you start out with. So they may be, depending on your domain, you may have insider information, you may have uh, credibility already, you might already have a team of people or know people that you can bring together to, to create that team. Um, some of the other ones that I'm gonna talk about are things that get built over time. So existing customers. So Google is a great example of this, where now they've got such a volume of people using their, their properties every day that they can do something like Google Plus and in a day get 10 million users because they've got such a, such, such a command over attention where they can, they can put out any product and really test it out very, very quickly, which a lot of people don't have. And that's an unfair advantage over people that may want to build something like Google Plus because they would struggle just to get 100 people on that service while Google can do 10 million in a day. Um, so that becomes an unfair advantage. Plus the existing customers you know, give, you, give you insights and knowledge and you may have maybe doing customer development, customer learning. So it also gives you insights from, from the, the pool of customers you have to then build better products, better customers that, that, that service their needs. Some other examples might be over time, you, you're able to attract the right celebrity type endorsements. So Twitter has got all kinds of celebrities using it um, 
among other people, but celebrities with, uh, and not just like Hollywood celebrities, but even you know, tech celebrities, sports celebrities, all kinds of people endorsing it and using it. And you see it on CNN, you see it Facebook over there. So all of those things kind of help over time and give you an advantage. If you were to build a Twitter clone today, it was not, it's not going to be a question of, of, of out executing them on features. It's just out executing them on all of those things, the network effects and all these other things that are already going, going on for them. They build that unfair advantage for themselves. So I already talked about large network effects, but kind of the op kind of a smaller version of that is community. You might even not have you know 500 million people, but if you can build a strong community of loyal customers, Flickr in its very early days did not have millions of users, but did have a very strong community of of enthusiasts and photo, photo you know professional amateur photographers that really loved Twi that, that really loved Flickr, and were very loyal to it and helped really spread it and make it uh, quite successful. So that's an example of a smaller version of the large, the large network effects being an advantage. And then other things that are, are achievable, again, over time are things like SEO ranking. So I don't put AdWords in this, in this boat because that's, that's an example of something that can be easily bought. So if, you may, if, if you've got these keywords that are working really well for you, nothing prevents a competitor with bigger wallets to discover those keywords and come and outbid you. And in, in those battles, the only one that really wins is Google because they get to pocket the, the higher elevated rates, and both startups kind of lose in that, in that battle. But if you've got more organic search ranking, you can definitely be unseated over time, but it's not going to be overnight. And as long as you continue to produce a great content, you're, you're, you're able to maintain that, that leadership spot. So that's an example of an advantage that you may have that's more, un, that more sustainable than, than just getting the, the paid ranking. And then, f and then the, the ninth one I put on here, a lot of people ask about patents. And there I kind of say it's a maybe. It depends on the industry you're in. So obviously, if you're in the drug industry, research, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of companies that get built just based on those patents. And they're able to, 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 to strongly enforce them. And that is the key part here. The, the patent is a defensive mechanism. So for a, a startup, for most people in this room, I'm, I'm expecting, they don't have the resources to defend an infringement of the patent. And it's not something, there's not a patent police out there that will say, oh, we noticed that this company is infringing on your patent. We'll collect, we'll, we'll sue them, we'll collect the damages and pay it off to you. There's no such service. Maybe there's, that's an idea for, for someone. But there's, there is no such service um, out there. So all the, all the enforcement comes upon you. Plus, you're giving away, in some ways, the secret sauce. So like when Skype, for example, built their protocol for peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, communication, they did not go the patent route. They actually went the opposite route, which was, which was used very heavy encryption, which was to obfuscate the protocol so it couldn't be reverse engineered because they didn't want people like infringing on, if, if they had done a patent, they would have to disclose how they did it. And it would create copycats, which they would have to go after, and they didn't want to be in that business. So they actually preferred the other route, which is will make it so hard to break. Even the governments have tried to break it and, and not been able to break Skype. Now it has been broken, but for the longest time, it was a completely closed protocol. And that gave them that huge advantage for a very long time. So I do kind of say this is more a maybe. In, soft, in the software world, it tends to not be an advantage, but in other industries, it, it can be an advantage. And then the one that I put on here is also things that tend to be aspirational. They don't en end up looking like unfair advantages, but they become ones over time. And so a great, a great story or a great example of that one is the, Zap the, the uh, Zappos story. So if you look at Zappos, it was a company that, s that sells online shoes. It got acquired by Amazon for, for $1.2 billion, um, I think earlier this year. I forget the time frame. But essentially what, what they built their whole brand about, around was customer happiness and just happiness in general. So their, their CEO, Tony Shea, has a big belief in, in creating happiness for people around him. So not just customers, but employees and just people around himself. And even very early on, he, he instilled that core value in everything they did. And they had many business practices which didn't seem like very good business practices. So for example, they had a practice of, of uh, of, uh, they, they had this directive to customer service representatives to do whatever was possible to make their customers happy. And that was just all they told them. And so while in, in that industry at, at the time, a lot of people were measuring customer service rates in, in terms of like length of calls and, and how you know, ratings at the end of it, you know, five out of five or four out of four, they were just saying, do whatever it takes to make customers happy. And, they, and as a result of that, their, their longest um, kind of cu customer call rate uh, customer call length to record has been in the order of six hours, something like that. Because that was a case where one of the customers called 
and they had a weird condition where their shoes would keep falling off and the customer service rep stayed online and like did all this research and and got her to a point where she had some solutions that she could actually use to keep her keys uh, basically keep her shoes shoes on and and and, uh, and even another another example of that is Tony Shea himself had this bet with his co-founder that we have we have instilled this culture and we need to test it. So at 3 a.m. in the morning, he he made a bet with his co-founder that we could call in our customer service line and get them to order us pizza. And so this was 3 a.m. Not many places were open. This is a shoe place, not a pizza place. But they called in, and sure enough, the pizza was delivered to them. So this is an example of where they instilled that culture. And it this doesn't sound like very good business practice, but it actually did pay off because it created a very loyal customer base that kind of loved the brand, loved the company. They were not a low-cost provider. In fact, they did other things there, too, is they, um, they have two-way free shipping, 365-day return policy. So if, you, if you're thinking of buying a shoe, you're not sure which ones, they encourage you to buy multiple, multiple shoes and see which ones you like. Um, if you're not sure of size, buy multiple sizes and just return the rest, and there's no cost to you. So all those things really don't make any sense if you were trying to build this optimized, profitable business. But those values paid off for them because Amazon valued it and bought them for a boatload of money. So, so there are examples of these unfair. So the unfair advantages are things. The reason I put them on there is that they may not be things you have. It may be things you have today. Maybe things you can grow into. But they may also be these things that you that you believe to be what you want to see, what you want to do um, with with your company, with your culture, and kind of run business a different way. And those may become advantages, but you know they're only tested over time. Yeah, I, well, again, I, I think in some industries that that might might happen, but I think there are more examples that actually prove the counter. And I almost say the first mover is a disadvantage. That's what I feel. And I, I, I also have the analogy of, um, yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it tends to be more of a disadvantage. If you look at every Facebook as an example, it was not the first. They were the 11th or 12th. Um, Microsoft and Apple, they never really built anything first. They've always kind of... Yeah, but they were, but the iPad was they still had like alternatives. There were still tablets out there. Sure, it was a it was a very it was a very different um, kind of device, and it brought a lot of technology innovation. But fundamentally, it was still in that category of kind of between a netbook and between a laptop. But I but I do feel that yeah. So so I, in, in in many respects, I find that and there's also a great book by uh, Randy Commissar got, called Getting to Plan B, where he talks about these concepts of analogs and antilogs. And the idea there is that for every idea that, that people have, sometimes there are many versions of it that have been tried before. And there's a lot of lessons that can be learned there. And so the, the analogs are things where you, which are similar to yours but maybe didn't quite work for some reason. And so if you go back in history and you study them, like Skype also was not the first. There was internet phone, uh, uh, yeah, in, internet calling that was there for a long time. The quality wasn't quite good and it wasn't quite as scalable and all of those things were too expensive. And so they were able to kind of learn from that and create a service that was more compelling. So that's what the analogs help you do. And antilogs are kind of a similar way to look at companies that have done something similar, but they kind of go against the grain. Like they actually failed. And you want to, you want to understand like why, why they failed or what, what didn't work about them and, um, and kind of build, build around that. So any other questions or comments on the unfair advantage piece? So again, the, the message here is that if you don't have an unfair advantage today, either leave this box blank or try to fit, fit in something that makes sense for your particular business that you want to kind of build over time. And it's one of those boxes, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, is that whether you want to or not, if you, once you start to get any level of success, once you get near product market fit, more often than not, your unfair advantage will be tested for you automatically. There will be copycats that will enter the business because they see that you've got something that's working, and people will inadvertently come in, and you will have to defend your position. And so you might as well start thinking about what that defense might be now, and again, start thinking of how you might build something that, that protects you when that does happen, because it will, it will happen if you're going to be successful. Okay. So in the Cloudfire example, this was a, this was a case where I, I think what we were trying to build was a niche product that was focused more on parents. And so the unfair advantage we wanted to kind of build here was rather than go after all the, all the um, potential photo sharing and video sharing use cases, we were going to make this be a very deep uh, focused application just in the parents market. 
and so that so so building the idea of a community and building something that maybe we build some value around that later on was where we thought the unfair advantage would really come from, and so that's what I kind of list list out for for this particular this particular case. So this is an example where even though we have this technology, which this no upload technology, which really at the time they were only a handful of people that were doing something similar, and even the way they were doing it was very different from what we were doing. I didn't necessarily see that as being an, a sustainable unfair advantage because if we did manage to build something here, chances are we would get copycat. So it had to be something that um, that would be able to, to kind of stand the stand the test of, of of just the features or just the capability of that platform. 